Nicholas Bertner with School of Permaculture. Guys, we got something awesome today. I'm here with uh, the Joel Salatin. Yeah. How you doing, Mr. Joel? I'm doing very well. Thank well, you. Well, man, I tell you, we brought us some students over there to the Soul Conference yesterday that was hosted by the Carbon Economy Series, and um, they just didn't know what to expect. And it, <laughs> And then there's Joel Salatin over there, like cutting a hog, you know, <laughs> right in front of you know hundreds of people. That was awesome. But uh, the reason um, I, I kind of wanted to come here today is um, not so much just another interview, but you do a lot of sustainable work, and you have the premier farm um, for regenerative uh, animal systems and, and farming. But we, you know, not a lot of people maybe know where you're coming from. Like, what brought you to this point? Um, you've been a farmer, I think, your whole life. Right. But, uh, but kind of, um, what's the story, Joel? Uh, yeah. Well, um, you know, I can tell you from my earliest memory, um, I wanted to be a farmer, and, and I don't, you know, when you say earliest memory, um, obviously it, it wasn't as as um, I was looking through a glass darkly. You know, it was it was it was not it was not in full. Uh, uh, whatever uh, um, yeah, definition, but, you know, it wasn't right, a full right, definition. Right, right. It, it wasn't. It was a little bit. It was a little bit fuzzy. But, <clears throat> but I, I really, um, when I look back, I realized there were there were some some critical uh, elements, and one was just a sense of abundance. I had a I had a my grandfather, my dad's father, had a very very large garden in Indiana. And it was surrounded on three sides by a, a tea trellis a grape arbor. And we would go up there always in the late summer because we had to finish, you know, making hay and different things at home before we could go up there and visit. So every time we went up and visit, um, there were these grapes just hanging off of this arbor. Of course, I was, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old where I could just reach up and grab these. And the, the smell and just the, the honeybees and the, the dripping grapes in this, in this uh, garden um, uh, affected me greatly to, 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 to step into this nest of abundance. You know, we live in a, we live in a time when uh, a lot of people are paranoid of scarcity and they think, they think the earth is a, is a reluctant partner, a, a, a kind of a, a hold back, a hold back thing. And actually, you know, the earth is a, uh, is a place of uh, well, I, I call it an object lesson of God's provisional abundance, you know, awesome. uh, 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 providing and his sufficiency. And so to be able to step out of my back door every day into a womb of abundance mm -hmm. is like stepping into a cradle. And that, that, that image, you know, just never, never got away from me. Wow, man, that's that's poetry. I mean, it sounds amazing. Which part of Indiana was that? Uh, well, it was in the uh, it was in the Newcastle Anderson Anderson Indiana area, part of the Rust Belt now. Yeah. Uh, you know, since I was a kid, Anderson has probably lost you know whatever half of its population. Yeah, uh, it's a ghost town now compared to what it was you know when, when I was growing up and the auto manufacturing and all that. But uh, yeah, that was that was the area. So you had that backyard, like basically abundance, you know, because we're here to give life and life more abundantly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what um, What happened after? So we kind of branched out from. Yeah. Well, then I, I had. A, I also had a great uncle who had a huge influence on me. Uh, that would be my grandmother's brother, who had a large chicken farm, also in Indiana, and um, and Uncle Omer. Um, took a delight in me, I think, and, and he, he saw a, a spark of interest. And, um, and we'd go over to his farm all the time, and, and he had these chickens out on range. In fact, as a youngest child, you know, when you first start carrying a billfold, um, you know, whatever, about you know, eight, nine, ten years old, um, I carried a billfold with his uh, business card, which was um, like uh, 3,000 chickens on a hillside that they had they had um, taken corn and written his name, O.M. Smith, on this hillside, and then taken a picture of it from the opposing hillside, and that was his business card, his name written with chickens, <laughs> you know, um, in, in, this, in this pattern. And that just really, in fact, I still have, you know, uh, the, the, the picture. Um, and, and so that really affected me. So at 10 years old, yeah. I got my first chickens at, at 10 years old and started into farm business. And um, my dad was an accountant uh, and, and a, you know, and, and a, a, a farmer, 
Mm -hmm. um, uh, but he never made a living farming. He, he, he never made it full time. We had a farm in Venezuela, South America, for he had, he was there for 14 years. And uh, when I was four, it got expropriated with, in a revolution, in a, in a junta. Um, it, uh, Is that habla uh, espanol? Uh, you see. Um, wow. So, so this was in, uh, this was the, the ouster of uh, Perez Jimenez in uh, 19, whatever, 60, 1959, 60. And um, 59 mainly, and um, we, we, we basically fled the back door as the guerrillas came in the front door. We lost everything, wow. lost a farm, lost all of his equity, lost everything. He was about 40 years old. And, uh, and, and we, went, we, 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 we stayed for another a year trying to get protection, but everything was bribed. You know, yeah. everything, and, and he said, look, I have a deed, I, it's my property, I paid for it. You know. Uh, no, Senor Saladin, you know. Uh, so anyway. Um, <laughs> Senor Saladin, we need to see that wallet with the yeah, chickens on yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Carbon that's chicken. right. So, you know, so that experience, um, during that time, he, you know, he met with, um, he met with, of course, the U.S. US ambassador in Caracas. And, um, and of course, with all the, the Venezuelan uh, ministers there as well. Um, and then with uh, a journalist, True Pearson, who was kind of an investigative reporter at that time, um, he would have been equivalent to today's say Fox News, and uh, and met with him in Caracas. Hmm. And um, of course, the U.S. was you know sending down all this foreign aid to the Venezuelan government, saying you know they're they're our friends and all this stuff. And um, so anyway, th there was nothing to do but leave. It. All the doors closed, and so so we left, walked away from it, came back to the U.S. Uh, Easter morning, 1961, landed in Philadelphia, and uh, looked at farms in a in a you know a, a crescent from like Pennsylvania down to North Carolina, trying to be a day's drive away from D.C. because Dad still was holding out hope that things would settle and that the Venezuelan ambassador would call him one day and say, "You can go back." Well, that did not happen, but that's one reason we settled with him. You know within yeah. what's today, a three hour drive of Washington, D.C. We looked, and we looked at a lot of farms and we found the most uh, eroded, uh, uh, a gully, a rock pile, uh, cheapest piece of land that we could find and settled there. And it was a, now it's a, it was definitely a gem in the rough. <laughs> and now it's the most gorgeous place in the area. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so you know, the, the, the beautiful thing about living systems as opposed to mechanical systems is that they heal. You know, that's what's different about, about life or biology compared to mechanics. You know, if you, if you have a bearing go out in your car, uh, there's nothing you can do about that bearing. You have to replace the bearing. You know, it, it do, you don't give it rest or, or um, you know, uh, time. Or, or, or ask its forgiveness, you know, for not lubricating it or, or whatever. And it doesn't say, okay, I'll, I'll get better tomorrow, you know. Um, but in human relationships, in the land, uh, biology, life, has the capacity to forgive, to heal, and, 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 to, and to, to change that way. It's, it's really quite a, a wonderful uh, gift. Yeah, that, that really is. That's that's amazing. I don't think a lot of people knew that you had uh, experience down in Venezuela. I lived down in Central America, which is just a little bit north up of mm -hmm. South South America, Venezuela. And Eugenia, the uh, yeah, Eugenia, yeah. she she she's, she's, she's Venezuelan. Yeah, yeah she was on the uh, on the Venezuelan uh, what bobsled team, the luge, 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 luge team. I, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> Luge in Venezuela. That's crazy. That's for for you guys who don't know Eugenia. Um, she'll she'll be on another one of these interview series. Make sure to check that one out. She's amazing. Yeah, she's the founder of the Carbon Economy series. Oh, definitely. And, uh, definitely. and has been instrumental in in this whole you know Santa Fe, Dallas, uh, Southwest region, uh, bringing these seminars to to people. Right. Let me see if I can get that cut off real quick. Man, that came on. I thought like somebody died or something real quick, dude. I was just like, you know, I was like, Joel, what'd you get us into here? It's my town, but still. That's hilarious. We'll cut all that out. So, um, 
Genia. So we, yeah, we were in Venezuela with the Genia, um, and 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 coming coming back to the U.S. So we basically, um, I mean, who knew Joel Salatin was down there in Venezuela? So you you started over here. You had this because um, I don't want to miss anything, you know. Um, basically, living on your granddaddy's farm, then dad and uh, family kind of back and forth Venezuela mm-hmm. and then you come back and you settle not too far away from Washington DC what what happened uh, what happened then? well what happened then was you know we had this we had this uh, what we call the you know the, the farm was the armpit of the community um, <laughs> I mean as far as just ugliness and it, it, it the, the farm had been through uh, it had been worn out I mean it was um, it was uh, absentee owned for many years from from eight from about uh, 19, 1900 to 1935 uh, or 1940, it had been absentee owned and le- and rented out and just 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 raped and abused and exploited. <clears throat> and so we came onto this rock pile. My dad though was quite a visionary, and he got a hold of some very early uh, Andre Voisin material on 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 grazing management. And being an economist, he understood that the, the chemical approach to farming was a, was like a drug addiction. It was, you know, you have to, you have to get more toxic, uh, use more stuff, it, it, it's a, <clears throat> it, it never satisfies. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, um, so. Greedy. It's yeah, it, greedy. It, it, it is, it's a, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I liken it exactly to an addiction. Yeah, it's yeah. just like heroin, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, like and so, um, so we, dad, dad realized, look, as a small farm, there are several things that have to happen. One is, um, we have to be as self-sufficient as possible. And so that started this wonderful search for a carbon-centric system. Nice. How do we, how do we actually power this farm with real-time sunlight instead of petroleum, chemical, yeah, and old, yeah. you know, underground energy? Okay? Yeah, yeah. How do we do that? And so, um, what so, year? What year? If you don't mind me asking, what year was this? Well, this was 1961. 61. 60, okay, 61. Yeah. We we uh, we we came to the farm there in, in early June of, of 61, and uh, and so uh, and and the other thing was, he knew that we had to stop the hemorrhage of the erosion. There was active active erosion gullies. We measured one gully 16 feet deep. You know, from the rim to the bottom of the gully. 16 feet deep that's you know that's deep okay that's like 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 a three guys standing on top of each other you know Mm -hmm. along you know that's like higher than the cheerleader stand for the you know for their (laughs) wait let's get another analogy for their pyramids that's like that's like higher than giza for a second (laughs) one second it's like more deep than a friggin (laughs) yeah than the keel on a sailboat yeah Yeah. okay Okay. I mean, I'd, I'd step in cracks and expanding clays shallower than this, Joe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, 16 feet, and these were just—they were like—they were like—I describe them like corrugated roofing on the side of the hills, you know, just yeah. just one after another, after another, after another. Oh my god! And so, so we we would actually uh, cut trees, bring branches in there, you mm. know, to 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 stop the water erosion and build up a little terrace of silt, you know, behind yeah. it. And uh, and and we, you know, some we put little uh, we put little dams of rocks, stones in, you know, to act as a as a barrier, you know. I wish I had pictures of this. Sounds like like Paleolithic or something. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we, we we were in the primitive, and we planted a lot of trees, and we fenced, and, and we actually fenced cows, uh, fenced animals out of some of these very steep hillsides, and just just essentially. It was too much to deal with, so we just walked away. We just abandoned it. Well, you know, gradually, nature, you know, nature doesn't want to be naked. The earth doesn't want to be naked, no. and it does a lot to try to clothe. And so first, you know. So your first, it was just a loincloth. Yes. And then, and no, then, it was worse than that. It was just, uh, you know, Not even bare, fig leaves. Yeah. yeah. In, fact, in fact, there was so little soil that, that we didn't have enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes. No, whoa, that's so, like a little so, soil. Yeah. yeah, so so Dad poured, he poured concrete in old car tires and pushed a half-inch pipe down <laughs> in his concrete. He'd pile these on a tractor platform, and my brother and I, you know, we were four and seven or five and eight, and we're three years apart, little kids, and he would pile these up on a tractor platform 
and drive real slow down through the field and we would, the two of us, we could get on the edge and heave this off and the dad would go and put electric fence stakes in because there were large areas, you know, um, uh, half the size of a football field that were simply bare shale, bare rock, no soil, no, I mean, no vegetation, no nothing, bare rock. I mean, in, in our area, arguably, you know, we lost between three and eight feet of topsoil, you know, since the, since the Europeans came and started plowing these hillsides. And that goes to show you the ingenuity of, you know, farmers of the day. You know, today somebody just would have brought in topsoil and like put it down, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, well so we, you know, so we, 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 we first wanted to arrest this act of erosion, stop the bleeding, if you will, stop, mm -hmm. stop the hemorrhaging. And, um, and then we gradually began the soil building process. We planted a lot of trees. We, we, then we finally were able to afford to, you know, to bring in some, uh, you know, some earth moving equipment to actually build some ponds in, in permaculture fashion. And we, we built some ponds. And, and, and so today, today, uh, all of these areas are, are um, you know, have soil on them. We don't use the tires anymore. Um, and, and we have five miles of gravity fed 80 psi water no pumps no electricity five miles of water line gravity fed water out over the entire place super cool with with um what what are you using for the pipe is it like the, well, like the, the plastic inch? plastic pipe plastic. yeah uh, flexible for the flexible stuff yeah well it's, it's poly you know it's it's poly, whatever you're a thing plastic yeah pipe, one of the, plastic I'm pipe. You. I'm black, black, you know comes in a big roll plastic pipe I know exactly roll it out. what you're talking about um you know and of course you can get it in all sorts of diameters we have everything from two inch down to three quarter inch okay but you got 80 Five psi. Or 80, 80 psi. That's, that's like a fire hose. Yeah, no, that's yeah, like, like a, blow, almost blow your fingertips yeah, yeah, off. Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 And 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 it's all gravity. Um, so we've built these ponds. You that's know, permaculture right. is all about building yeah. ponds yeah. up on high ground because because then you can use this water. The thing that's really changed the, the game changer has been this black plastic pipe because you know where when P. A. Yeomans was doing his work, water yeah. for every farm, um, back in the '40s, he didn't have plastic pipe. And so he had to, he could only get water, um, uh, you know, run it on, on, on gravity, you know, yeah. uh, he made like swales and like and off little, contour. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like okay. The key right. line system. But now, yeah, the key yeah. line, yeah. But now with plastic pipe. <clears throat> totally changed the game. We, we can, we can go you know, uphill, downhill, as long, as long as the end of it is lower than where it comes in. Yeah. We can go uphill, downhill, and, and totally all makes over the it place. easier. Yeah. It, 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 it completely revolutionized it. And when did you guys put that stuff in? Well, I, I began it in uh, uh, probably in the late '80s. I, I oh, began wow. uh, doing doing That's some real pioneer of this. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, and uh, in the uh, late yeah, this is pioneer Joel <laughs> Salatin right here. Nobody was doing that in the '80s, really. Yeah, it, well, I mean, I mean, talk about early '60s. Dad, Dad invented a portable electric fencing system in the early '60s this with tires. <laughs> with, with, with tires, but but with. Um, uh, he'd go to the hardware store and get uh, masonite. It was like a, it's like a cheap plywood, and cut it out with a jigsaw and make electric fence reels. Because you didn't have electric fence reels in those days. Um, <laughs> That's so cool. And, and, I mean, we're just getting, we're getting like history here, yeah, right? That's yeah, super yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what's I mean, your dad's name? Let's uh, get him. Bill. Here. Bill. Bill. Uh, Bill. Sal yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bill Senor uh, in, 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 in Spanish, of course, this is Guillermo. Uh, William Guillermo Guillermo Salatin yeah and um, and he he uh, so he, he developed a, a portable electric fencing system uh, awesome. you know we were we were using uh, electric fence energizers were so primitive they were essentially um, uh, scavenged um, points and condensers out of cars at that at that time Whoa. you know where you had where the pulse was made by the by the points, you know, from from the, like the distributor cap of the old cars, and and so we carry around. I do a lot. That sounds so foreign to me. I'm just kind of like, just what in the world are yeah, you talking about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so we carry around a piece of emery cloth in our pocket. Every time we'd walk by, you know, we we'd shine up these points because they'd get you know they'd get dull and they'd get you know, and then you wouldn't have any any spark. Wow. And so so um, yeah, this this was this was early, and um, and. So he, you know, really he, the birthing he, of, of mobile electric yeah, fences. Yeah, 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 yeah. Th this was primitive. Yeah. Also, you know, primitive um, chainsaws. I mean, I'm I'm realizing that you know chainsaws have come in my lifetime, and chainsaws, of course, are a, are a critical component of a carbon centric, of, of a truly carbon centric 
um, system mm -hmm. because you've got to be able to handle and steward trees efficiently. Um, and so, so uh, think of what that's done in our ability to, um, to leverage carbon, to leverage mm -hmm. uh, biomass, yeah. you know, what the yeah. chainsaw has done to be able to leverage biomass. It's, it's quite, as opposed to just using fire, you know, the, the primitives used fire. That, that's all they do. Yeah, and so, so now, yeah, yeah, so now we can use the chainsaw instead of fire and, and get, and, and use um, strategically leveraged composting systems mm -hmm. as opposed to fire. So we can actually get accomplished this, this mineral cycle, this whole mineral and humus cycle, we can, uh, 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 we can actually upgrade and run this cycle much more uh, efficiently now, yeah. efficaciously, than you could 400 years ago. That's super rad, man. So, like, what what uh, what chainsaw would Joel Salzman recommend? <laughs> <laughs> well, are, are we a still? We're, 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 we're really we're really down to two, you know, brands. One is the still, and one is the Husqvarna. And uh, I happen to run Husqvarna's. Yeah, um, yeah. Th th those are those are my uh, awesome. those those are my saws. We we got you know twenty four inch. I mean, we uh, 18, tw twenty inch. Twenty yeah. inch. Yeah, that's that's a good pe person size. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's a uh, you know we we cut some fairly large trees. We have a lot of forest on our farm, and and, and we we cut a lot. Um, but I, way, I, I use I use professional. You know, these aren't these aren't the homeowner. Oh, these, yeah. these are okay. professional. You know. Like they're they're, they're, made, they're made to run. I mean, they got power, man. We we're not getting backed up by either of these companies, <laughs> but you know, just figured you want to know. Figured you want to know. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, there used to be uh, 20 years ago there were lots of um, chainsaw companies, and yeah. they've pretty much been been um, you know consolidated into these two. Th two. These two have emerged as the you know the premier. Once they got really what's going on, you know, you got the oomph and the and the power behind it, and most yeah. farmers, I think, like to use it. Yeah, the know? Germans and the Swedes, you know, yeah. they're they're pretty sharp folks. Yeah, the Japanese just use the, you know, the katanas. <laughs> you know, that's awesome. And in <laughs> South America, everything's the machete. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, here in Texas, it's kind of the same. You know, yo soy medio mexicano, yo puedo decir. So, <laughs> yeah, we're getting some good stuff on this one. Yeah. So, I mean, that's awesome, man. So, I mean, what, to be honest with you, I'm, my mind's blown, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty early in the morning, so you can't see how blown my mind uh -huh. is right now. But they, we're getting a history of, of, like, friggin' electric fences, right? And then... Uh, and then the water. And then the yeah, water yeah, system. Yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, wh when, you, when, you, when you posit certain assumptions, other things grow out of them. So some people ask me, you know, well, well, you know, why is your family so clever? How did you come up with all this stuff? It was and, graced by God. Well, <laughs> it, it, it was, but, but I think the important thing to remember is that we started with the basic assumption, animals move. You know, we live in a time when our culture doesn't think yeah. animals should move. They think they should be locked up in a, in a confinement factory somewhere. And so as soon as you as soon as you look at nature's template and you and you assume mm, animals move, well, then you have to be able to control them. So now we need portable control because the control, I mean the neighbors don't want your animals, mm -hmm. right? So you gotta be able to keep them home. So we gotta have portable control. We've got to have portable water, because mm -hmm. we gotta get them, and we have to have portable shelter. And so all of our innovation, the electric fencing, the, the uh, water system and all of the shelters that we have, you know, the egg mobiles, the, the shade mobiles, the, the turkey mobiles, gobbledy goes, we call them, you know, the lamb shelters, Lamborghinis, um, <laughs> you know, all, 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 what, what about for bunnies? You gotta have some. <laughs> yeah, hairpin. Hair hairpin. <laughs> show blown, show blown. Where's my drum set? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, <clears throat> So, so all of these, you know, the, the chickens with the Millennium feather net, you know, um, but, but all of these portable uh, infrastructure systems, the, wait, hold on, hold on. the, 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 the Millennium feather, feather the net, <laughs> the Millennium feather net, yeah, yeah, uh, it, 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 comes, it comes from the Millennium Falcon in Star yeah. Wars, you know, um, <laughs> no. but, but, but Falcons aren't very friendly to chickens, you know, so right. we, we call it the Millennium feather net, it, it's ugly as crud, but man, does it move, you know. 
Han Solo. You know? Han Solo. It looks like a bag of bolts, but she's the fastest thing in the solar system. <laughs> so, so from the hog last night to this, I mean, yeah, yeah. so so the thing. The I'm thing, sorry. So the thing is, all all of our innovation has grown out of of function. Oh, definitely. For, 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 forget forget appearances, okay? Forget appearances, forget what anybody says, forget what the neighbors say. Just look at function. And so we've developed these things out of function. Um, and, and so so for example, you know, carbon centricity. How do you how do you actually run, build soil uh, um, based on carbon centricity? So that that moved us toward this kind of integration of forestry and open land. So we got a chipper, you know, a wood chipper. And we began working in the woods, diseased trees, crookeds, you know, junk trees, and those would go with the chipper, and that became the carbonaceous diaper under the cows in the wintertime when we feed hay mm -hmm. to molecularly bond the, um, the fragile volatile nutrients that a cow is dropping at 50 pounds a day. Manure, you're 50 pounds a day. I mean, yeah, that's a sack full, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's it, like a bath. It, it yeah. is. So it, it, it takes a big carbonaceous diaper to absorb all that so wow. it doesn't yeah. diffuse into the groundwater or, you know, evaporate into the air. And so that's moved us to a, to a, to a composting system. Well, well composting, how do, we, how do we get this stuff turned and how do we move it, you know, without a bunch of machinery and, and mechanics? And so that that morphed into the piggerator. So we use the, the, the pigs to t as the compost turners, you know, and we- I, just, I, I need to go to Polyface and just like, you know, take a picture of like everything. Yeah. And this is the piggerator. Yeah, yeah. And this and this is the Millennium- uh, uh, Feather okay. net. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have the Terminator, we got the piggerator. Yeah. And, and, and it's more than a cyborg, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And and so 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 instead of instead of um, us physically doing the work or buying machinery to do the work or, or using petroleum to do the work, uh, we're using animals to do the work, which fully respects and honors the, the pigness of the pig and the and the gifts and talents that the that the pig brings to the plate too. Yeah. And so suddenly now these animals are not just, you know, egg production, bacon, you know, whatever. These animals actually become our co-laborers, our, our fellow ministers in this great land healing ministry. You wow. know? And, and it really changes the spiritual and emotional relationship that you have with what you're, you know, what you're doing. Wow. When did that um, process come to be? So dad obviously came up with like, you know, mm -hmm. the electric sensor. Yeah, yeah. But when did it like, you know, when did it snap and say, hey, look, we got to move these animals around. Was it like day one you knew? Oh, uh, pretty much, pretty much. He, he, yeah, but but we but because of because of not having, you know, not having portable water and portable shade and, and all that, um, and, and good and good uh, you know uh, electric fencing. Um, initially, we would move the cows you know, like every two weeks. You know, we thought, man, moving them every two weeks. Well, we're really getting somewhere. You can move them every two weeks. Um, and then, as the as the rest of the as the rest of the pieces started to, to develop, um, then, then then you know we then, then with the shade mobiles, we weren't we weren't confined to the the cows need to be under trees. No, now we make we have a portable shade tree, so we move we move the shade mobile with the cows and uh, you know with nursery shade cloth and, and 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 so now we're not we're not confined to making sure there's a tree where the cows are. Now we we. We, You're moving it. We, yeah. we, move, we move the shade with the cows. Uh, as the water system developed, now we didn't have to go to a pond or a creek. Now we could go to the top of a hill and confine them here or to a hillside. And that allowed us to make sure that the manure and urine generated from the vegetation, from the biomass from that area, got put right back on that same area. It didn't get translocated from here to here to here. And so we were That's able to book. we were able to strategically place the the converted solar energy that converted into biomass into the fermentation of the of the herbivore the pruner if you will the herbivore is the pruner I call her the the, the biomass restart button okay <laughs> we were then able to strategically place that where it needed to be most. And, uh, and then, of course, the, as we developed the chipper and the composting, then we were able to even better uh, strategically place all these materials. 
and um, and the farm just um, it just blossomed. Right. It just blossomed and exploded. Wow! <clears throat> In the areas where you have um, you you wood chip down for the bedding for the cows, mm -hmm. do you move that? Yearly, or is that something that? No, that's that's under a, that's under a stationary shed. That's under time. under shade roof, yeah. so it's so it's protected. The the roof protects it from the winter, you know, rains and, and yeah. all that sort of thing. You go in there and kind of clean it out and use it on different areas, or you just keep yeah. It, you just oh no keep no it. no no. Well, we we I mean we when the cows are done eating hay and they go back out on pasture, then we put in the piggerators and the piggerators aerate it, turn it into compost, you know. Um, and and then and then and then we take it back out onto the fields, yeah. And then and then you know it feeds the soil, makes the soil more fertile. The fer the fer fertile soil can help plants be more robust, which makes the plants take in more sunlight, and sequester more carbon, and exhale more oxygen, so we can breathe easier, right? And, and the whole the whole system uh, works. I got to tell you, Joel, together. I've been you know. You know, doing some interviews here in the last few years, and just talking to you, it's like a brain whack, man. I mean, <laughs> we get into like you know silliness, and then the next topic, it's like really depth, you know, com you know, layered upon layered, you know, stacks of information. So you've been thinking about this for a long time. You've been doing it. Obviously, you've written books about it. Um, when did that kind of? Uh, I mean, we're, I, and I don't want to yeah. skip out too far. You no. Know? Well, what what happened was, uh, so I, you know, I came back to the farm full time September 24, 1982. <laughs> Teresa and I, you know, we made an apartment in the attic of the farmhouse. We called it our penthouse. You can call it an attic. We called it a penthouse. Uh, of course. And, 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 um, and you know, we lived, uh, we, we drove a $50 car. Uh, we wore thrift store clothes. If we didn't grow it, we didn't eat it. Teresa canned everything, made all of our own clothes. Wow. Um, you know, we had our larder. We grew all of our own food. We, we, we had our own heat. You know, we had our own firewood. So we lived on, you know, we were able to cut our, our living expenses down to less than $300 a month. And, and that meant we didn't have to make a lot of income. <clears throat> and it also meant that we were able, we were able, even with, you know, not professional type salaries necessarily, we were able to very quickly save enough to live on, a nest egg, to live on for a year. As soon as we got enough to live on for a year, I gave my two week notice, walked out of the newspaper office. I was a, I was a reporter. I was a journalist. <clears throat> Walked really? out of the office. Yeah. Wow. And uh, and and yeah, I was living at home and working at the at the daily newspaper in town. I love the news. Yeah, I, we just I, totally I, skipped over all that. Yeah, cool yeah. I, I mean, I, I I love. I mean, I'm still a news junkie. I'm a total news junkie. Yeah. Who, who, uh, what's your uh, your your drug of choice? Uh, well, I, I, I'm the I'm the investigative guy. You know, I I, I get it. Yes, sir. I mean, hard hard news. Uh, find the dirt, you know. Um, uh, bring the politician down, you know. Get find, get you know, catch the liar in his deceit, and and the you know, um, and and uh, Jesus, love him. <laughs> yeah, but not what they do. Um, <laughs> so so anyway, um, you know, and and I still, you know, if, if I could have a second life, I would still like to launch a. You know, a, a weekly hard news uh, newspaper. I think it would just be great. I, I think I think that a lot of um, of the, the, the whatever the the, the stupid um, uh, the stupid electing that people do um, is based on not having information. And, and I saw it in our own newspaper. You know, mm -hmm. oh, we can't write that story. You know, he owns a company that's a big advertiser for us, so we can't. You know, we can't touch him. And the same thing happens nationally. It happens in the state. And um, you know, I'm opposed to sensationalizing news. I'm also opposed to sanitizing news. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of sanitation of news. Happening. Another story for another time. Anyway, um, <laughs> September 24, 1982, I walked out of that office. We, we had one year of nest egg saved up. And I fully expected that I would have to go back to town to work you know, in a year. But I thought, you know what, we're, we're going to get so much closer to where we want to be in a year by me being home full time that maybe our total time away can be cut from, you know, 10 to 5 years or, or you know, 8 to 4 years. As it turns out, you know, the providence of God, I, we, we, I never had to go back to work. It was tight. It was tight. You know, we, we, we didn't have any cash. We didn't, we, we lived uh, frugally and cheaply. I always say the best, best decision I ever made was marrying a woman more frugal than, my, than, than, than I am. And, um, Amen. Amen. And so she knew how to pinch a penny, and um, uh, we were happy though. I mean, 
sometimes Teresa and I look at each other, you know, we've been married 35 years this year, and we say, you know what, we'd go back to that in a heartbeat. You know, no money, but no, you know, just our, you know, just out there on the farm, you know, just ourselves. We had this dream, you know, we just wanted to be full-time farmers. Well, what happened then was that, um, That's awesome. that, that we, that we, we, you know, we, we stuttered, we stumbled, and we moved along, and, and I, you know, I helped some people build fence, I helped a guy plant trees, you know, picked up some odd things along to, you know, look, when you're living on 300 bucks a month, if you can pick up a little side job for five or 600 bucks, that's a lot of money, yeah, okay? Yeah. And, and, it, and it, it eased us along. Um, and then, um, and then a, a friend uh, of the family was raising these chickens and um, they were getting elderly, and uh, they wanted somebody to take over their little their little chicken thing. They they raise about three hundred a year. They would keep about a hundred for their own family. Uh, they were Amish Mennonite family, and then they would sell a couple hundred. And the idea was so we can we can get our own chickens free, okay? And 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 they they knew that I'd raise chickens, and they said, you know, do you think you could take this little business from us and, and take care of our customers? And I'd raised chickens, you know, since I was 10 years old. And I went to college, you know, we pulled my chicken shelters, my pastor chicken shelters for egg layers up in the rafters of the barn, you know. I shut the business down and went to school. They were still hanging in the barn rafters, right? I said, well, sure, you know, I can do that. That sounds like a fun thing, you know. And so we pulled the old chicken shelters down out of the rafters of the barn. And, um, and I put these broilers in them. Of course, that family was not raising them that way. They were raising them more in a kind of a, a glorified backyard, you know, uh, uh, range system. And uh, put them down, put them back in, the, in those chicken shelters, took the nest boxes out, you know, and made them lighter and just put them in the, in the shelters. Well, that burst the pastured poultry thing as, wow. as we know it today. And- um, 82. And, and, and well, that was in about 84. Two years later. About 84, yeah. Well, what happened was that that, that began to take off. Um, and, and the chickens, the chickens, uh, they were moneymaker. Uh, people liked them. They were really, I mean, they were aha, different than what was in the store. And, uh, and they, they were away, you know, we were selling freezer beef and, and quarters of beef at the time. But that's, a, that's an expensive way to, to get in. If you don't want to go to Walmart or the supermarket or whatever, getting a half a beef or a quarter beef is, is an expensive way to get in to the alternative food system. But a chicken, that's easy. You know, a couple bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few dollars and you're in, okay? And so, so that, that, was a, that was a wonderful little kind of an appetizer, if you will, as opposed to this big you know, side of beef or whatever. And so the chicken thing began to take off, That's and, amazing. and by the late by the late eighties, um, you know, we were getting some 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 traction, um, not just in customers, you know, but but just in in people that heard about it and were interested. You know, how is this done? And so um, so in nineteen uh, about eighty eight, I was the president of the Virginia Biological Farmers Association. I was young, you know, I was. 30 years old yet and and it was kind of, of it. yeah yeah and and um, it was kind of an assumption that the president would host this annual kind of farm day that the group had small you know it was a group of a couple hundred people <clears throat> and so we we hosted that that day that year and a columnist for Stockman grass farmer came down Roger Wentling from Pennsylvania heard about the, the thing he came down saw it he just went nuts over what we were doing wrote a column for Stockman grass farmer which was a fledgling publication started by Alan Nation in Mississippi, um, uh, uh, trying to uh, trying to create an American counterpart to New Zealand New Zealand type type grass you know controlled grazing and, and rotational sheep and, and cattle farming. <clears throat> well, Alan saw the, you know got the column and he just went nuts over it. Next thing I know, he calls me and says, "Could I come up and visit?" He came up and visited. I said, would you write a column for me? In art, you know, articles. Well, I'd been out of the newspaper. I was, you know, I was getting the jitters from, you know, withdrawal from not writing. You know, great. You know, sure, I'll write a write a thing for you. He said, I'm bankrupt. I can't pay you a dime. But you know, I'd like you to write. So I began writing. And the next year, then in uh, whatever, in uh, 1989, uh, I guess, or 90, <clears throat> he had the first American 
grass farmer conference and invited me to come and speak. End of story. I mean, then, it, it, then um, you know, at that national audience, you know, had about 300 people mm -hmm. from all over the world, and suddenly it launched. And, and, and from then, it's just been one, I mean, it, it, you know, it, 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 it's like anything, it, it's had its uh, steps. I'm now just the, you know, omnivore's dilemma. You know, omnivore's dilemma was a, you know, was a step. And uh, certainly, uh, Food Inc. was a step. Um, but our own, you know, our own, uh, what we were doing just has continued to, to inspire the hearts and souls of, of uh, the, the food and farming uh, movement in a way that we could not have ever imagined. And you know, on behalf of those people, you know, myself and thanks, I mean, mm -hmm. you've really been a pioneer and a, cool. uh, an inspiration to a lot of us who just want to do good stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. Well, it's been, uh, it's been a real ride. And uh, and it's been uh, it's been a real blessing to uh, meet you know literally thousands of people around the world that come up to me and say you know we're we're farming because of you you know that's just it, it, it just kind of makes me tear up so it's 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 really a, really a, a wonderful thing man you're a great man dude I'm just, we're gonna reach across I'm gonna give you a tap you're awesome dude and and, and you know while we're here. Uh, do you, do you like uh, electric guitar or acoustic guitar? <laughs> yeah. Here, you ready? <laughs> hey, man. Good. You rock. I love you. Guys, okay. that's uh, Joel Salatin. Uh, check out all his stuff. Uh, you know who he is. He's amazing. Go and buy his books. Uh, make sure to check out schoolofpermaculture.com where we have interviews like this. I love you, and I'll see you. We'll see you next time. You know, before we uh, before we go, if you if I can have the honor, to pray with you. Absolutely, that's You'd amazing. Yes, Lord, indeed. you are amazing. Thank you for this goodness and.